you know, there's a lot of different definitions about what a victorious life is. Uh, in its most simplistic terms, uh, most people equate the victorious life simply with the forgiveness of sin and salvation. But in a larger sense, uh, we know that victorious life is really using all of the blessings, all of the gifts, and all of the power that God gives us in our daily lives. And to be able to live successfully before him and to be able to implement his will in earth. So that's what we're really here to talk about today. We've got four speakers that are going to talk on four different subjects. For those of you that have been here before, this is the third session of the gospel series. The first one was uh, on spreading the gospel, what the gospel is and how to teach it to other people, how to proclaim to other people. Uh, the second one was discipleship, how to be a disciple and how to make disciples. So today we're culminating with taking everything that we learned in Gospel 101 and Gospel 102 and we're putting all that, th all that learning into action and into motion so that we are able to use those things that we learned to live a victorious life. So that's what we're about today. Um, does anybody have anything for us before I start? Okay, okay. And we've already prayed, so everybody ought to be ready. Um, we'll just go ahead and get started because uh, we're, I think we're already running a little bit late, but uh, uh, God will work with us on that. So I want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, she's uh, a lady that uh, has come to be a, be a very good friend of mine. Her name is Pamela Short. She's the wife of our friend Wayne Short, who uh, is a student at STC Bible College. They minister together at uh, From Behind the Veil Ministries over on Fuller Mill Road. And uh, Pam, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to come up. Pam's been in education for a long, long time. Uh, I know that she's currently engaged at uh, Forsyth Technical Community College, FTCC. Yeah. And uh, Pam, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Good morning. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Dale for inviting me to come and speak this morning, and also for the pastor to let us use this wonderful facility. Uh, this is a beautiful place, and um, just open your hearts this morning, and I know we've already prayed, but I always like to pray again before I start speaking, because I know it's, it's not me who speaks, it's God through me, and I want him to minister to your hearts as he directs and leads so let's just refocus and close our eyes and just open your hearts lord i just thank you for allowing us to be here today we open our hearts our ears our eyes to hear to see and to understand your word and lord i pray that as i speak that you will speak through me and that it will minister to each heart as you purpose in jesus name i thank you lord amen all right so this morning we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and empowerment and the gifts. And this is, I started thinking this is kind of a class and I'm used to being in a classroom. <laughs> I'm used to standing up in front of students and even in front of faculty and teaching. And so I thought, well, how would I teach my class? Well, I have my little syllabus and my outline, but there's a point, there's a message. And I thought of this class as a survey class. A survey is like a broad overview of a lot of different things. And the focus today is the Holy Spirit in my, in my message. And there's a lot of confusion and division in the church about the Holy Spirit. And it's really important that we understand and know what the purpose 
and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. You know, we have the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And most Christians, they'll accept the God the Father, and they'll accept God the Son, but it, when it comes to God the Holy Spirit, they, they're kind of on wavering ground there. They don't know, it, they don't know what it means, what he means, what his purpose is, all the speaking in tongues, all of that. So it, it creates a lot of division in the church. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this morning, I'm going to talk about some of the ministries and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to just open up your heart and receive as from the Lord. Okay? I know I'm Pamela. I'm standing in front of you. But the word that's being spoken will be the word. Okay? So I'm going to have a lot of scriptures. All right? I have it um, in a format. If you need it emailed to you or text to you, I can do that afterwards. But I have a lot of scriptures because you can't deny the word. All right? You, you can't deny the word. So I don't want it to be my words, but it's God's word speaking through me. So even though when we read scripture sometimes it's hard for us to receive things that challenges our traditions our beliefs the things that we grew up in but let's remember today that it's the word of god that's coming out and receive it as that so i want to first look at what jesus said about the ministry of the holy spirit in john chapter 14 verse 26 he says the helper and then he uses a comma, the Holy Spirit, and another comma. And that means that he is explaining who the helper is. He is saying the helper is the Holy Spirit. And it is who the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. So the helper is not on the Holy Spirit is not only our helper, but our teacher. He's that inner witness that guides us into the truth of the word. It says he will teach you all things. Well, what are the things that we need to be taught? We need to be taught the mysteries of God, the word of God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's his ministry. So if we're not open to receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we're always going to have a hard time when we read in the word and we study the Bible we're gonna have a hard time digging out those mysteries and those truths and Jesus said I want you to know my mysteries I want you to know the truth that's in the word because the world cannot understand the mystery of the word only Christians can children of God why because we're the ones who can receive the Holy Spirit and he's the one who teaches us and helps us understand in Mark chapter 13 verse 11 it says, when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Notice he said speak three times in this one verse. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He speaks. He speaks to us. When does he speak to us? All the time. Every day, all day. But are we listening? Are we open to hear his voice? Whenever somebody comes to us and starts accusing us of things that we may or may not have done, that somebody starts accusing us of an offense that we've caused to them, what do we try to do? Do we pause and wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to us? Or do we just start speaking for ourselves on our behalf? So the Holy Spirit is there to speak for us and to us, to be our advocate. He's our helper so that we don't have to defend ourselves because God is our defender. He is our vindicator. So let's pause and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Luke's version of, the, Luke's version of this same verse says that the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. In Luke 12, verse 11 through 12, it says, When they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, don't worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what to say. Because he's our teacher. Teachers show you things that are right, that are wrong, 
They show you the way to live. They educate you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And I'm using New King James Version if, you're, if your Bibles are different. Um, <clears throat> we can see an example of this because the Bible, not only will it tell you and explain to you the purpose of the Holy Spirit, it gives examples of the Holy Spirit working through people. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 67, before John the Baptist was conceived, God told Zacharias what was going to happen. But Zacharias didn't, didn't receive that. He, he was like, oh, no, that, that can't happen. So what did God do? He shut his mouth. He shut his mouth so that the fulfillment of the word of God could happen. And when John was born, the Holy Spirit filled him. And what happened? It called Zacharias to speak again. In verse 67, it says, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying. And then he went on to prophesy about John's life and about Jesus' life. In another instance, in John chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus said, Jesus said, our example. Who agrees? Jesus is our example, right? Jesus is our example. And Jesus said what? He said, I speak whatever the Father tells me to speak. And how does he do that? Because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that spoke to him from the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one that go-between that says, okay, Father, you, your words are this, and he delivers it to us, his children. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to be able to speak what the Father said, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit to speak to us? what the Father is saying. So we have these scriptures showing us that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he gives us the words to speak that will line up to the will of God. So let's look at another work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, It's beneficial to you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper, that comforter, that teacher, that intercessor will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, what is he going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin. Without the Holy Spirit, the world cannot be convicted of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who speaks in favor of another. That's what that word helper in the New King James Version, in the King James Version, it says comforter. But if you look up the Greek, it says it's helper, comforter, intercessor, and it means one who speaks in favor of another. How many of you need someone to speak favorably of you to God? Do you need someone to speak in favor of you to God because you have an accuser of the brethren that's speaking before God, that's saying all these bad things that's going on, those things that you did this morning or last night or on the way here, those things that have been wrong. <laughs> you have an accuser speaking before the Father. But you know what? We have the Holy Spirit, an intercessor who's also speaking before the Father, who knows the heart of the Father and speaks on our behalf. That's the Holy Spirit. It's so much more beneficial that we have the Holy Spirit because now all of us know we can all receive that download from God the Father. We don't have to have one single person standing up telling us what God is saying. Each of us can hear the word from the Father. And that's by the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, verse 26, it says, When the Helper comes, who I shall send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit here is called the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. He has so many names, just like Jesus he has so many names. He is the spirit of truth. And what does that spirit of truth do? He bears witness of God's love and salvation because he brings conviction to man. 
And what is that conviction? It's not condemnation. How did you come to receive the Lord as your Savior? It wasn't through this whole weight of condemnation. It was the conviction realizing that although I'm under this weight of condemnation and under this weight of guilt, there is a God who loves me. That's what brought us to salvation. That there's still a God who loves me despite all this other stuff. And that's the Holy Spirit. He is saying, I'm the spirit of truth. Where the world will say that God wants to kick you off the planet. The spirit of truth is saying, there's a God who loves you. There's a God who wants fellowship with you. Despite all the other stuff that's going on in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's testifying of God's love. So in John chapter 16, verse 12 through 15, it says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, again explaining he is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth has come, he will do what? He will guide you. He will guide you into all truth. Why? Because he's the spirit of truth. We don't have to be the blind leading the blind. Why? Because we have a guide. And our guide is the Holy Spirit. And he's taking you by the hand and he's saying, come and follow me. Walk with me. Step where I step. Go where I go. And you'll walk into truth. You won't fall. You won't stumble. You won't believe the lies of the world. You won't go with the crowd because there is a spirit of truth there to guide you. Because he's not speaking on his own authority. Whatever he hears... He will speak, and he will tell you things to come. That is such a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. He tells us things to come. Have you ever had that unction just down in your belly, and you're like, "Mm, that's not right. Or you've had that peace where you're like, it's time for a change. Time for a new season in my life, and I want to go over here. I want to do this. I want to do that. That unction that you feel, well, that's the Holy Spirit that's guiding you. And he'll tell you things to come. Sometimes I've had before an instance where I was working, I had a great employee, and I just knew that they were going to get another job. The Lord told me months and months. I didn't say anything to them, but I started making plans. And then a few weeks later, a few months later, they came into my office and said, I've applied for this other position and I've been offered. I was able in that moment, rather than have a nervous fit and go crazy and stuff and worry, I was able to say, congratulations, you've been a great employee. I wish you all the best. Why? Because I listened to the Holy Spirit. He showed me the things to come. And why would he do that? Because he says, don't worry about anything. When things unexpected happens, that causes worry to kind of flare up. You know, whenever something that happens and it seems like things are falling apart, we start trying to worry about it. But God says, don't worry about it, cast your care. But in many instances, if we were just sensitive to the Holy Spirit beforehand, he would give us that little stirring in our spirit, just in our stomach. And he'd start unctioning us and saying, this is going to happen. And giving you that little inclination. Who's had that happen before? Just a small stirring. You knew something was going to happen. But then when it happened, if you paid attention to it and you started praying about the situation and you listened and you recognized it for the Holy Spirit, when it really happened, you don't have that worry. You don't have that fear, that concern. Because you look back and you can say, Thank you, Father. Because the Holy Spirit revealed to me the things that were coming. I might not have wanted to believe it, But at least I knew (laughs) ahead of time and I could prepare myself. Thank you, Father, because you love me just that much. It says in verse 14 that he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. So what he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit is declaring Those things that are Christ, he is speaking that to us. Now, what is Christ? His things are his inheritance. So the Holy Spirit is that witness that is declaring to us what our inheritance is. 
that we have healing when the doctor says that we're going to die, that we have prosperity when we just got fired from our jobs, that our kids are going to live and not die whenever they face a sickness. That is what the Holy Spirit is declaring to us because that's the inheritance we have because we are Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's ministry. Let's look at an example of how this works in the Bible, an example of this, because I just said there's examples of the Holy Spirit's ministries throughout the Bible. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 27, it says, Behold, a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, or Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 27. The Holy Spirit was upon him. In verse 26, it says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. That is showing things to come. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It, re it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And in verse 7, it says, So he came by the Holy Spirit to the temple. What's that an example of? That is showing that he allowed the Holy Spirit to guide him where he needed to be. At the right place, at the right time, so he would see the right people and have the right words to say. Those are things I pray almost every day. Lord, guide me to the right place at the right time to be in front of the right people and have the right things to say. Why? Because if you miss an opportunity, you may miss a divine appointment. And I don't want to miss any opportunities that God has set before me to take. And if I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit, if I'm not listening to my guide, then I don't know where to go. So we have to incline our ears to him. It says, so he came to the temple and when the parents, this is Jesus' parents, brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. And Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said. What did he say? He said the things that the Holy Spirit had received from God the Father and delivered to Simeon and he spoke and prophesied. That's all of those ministries wrapped up into one event where the Holy Spirit is able to use someone who was listening, who was willing to follow the guide, and who was willing to speak what he heard the Holy Spirit say. And he prophesied. I want you to understand the Holy Spirit is here to prepare you for the things of the future. The Holy Spirit is here to guide you into your destiny that God has for you. Are you listening? Are you following him? If you're confused about what his ministry is and you're wrapped up into all the division that the enemy's trying to bring into the church because of the Holy Spirit, you're never going to fulfill the work that God has for you. The Holy Spirit is necessary to fulfill what God has for you. And we'll see this. Jesus is our example, right? Who knows? Jesus is our example. Okay? So let's see. That last statement I said, without the Holy Spirit, you will never fulfill the complete destiny and purpose God has for your life. How do I know this? Because in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 23, it says, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened up. And what happened? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus like a dove. And, heaven, and a voice came and God said, God said, when the Holy Spirit came, God said something. He said, you are my beloved son and in you I am well pleased. And then in verse 23, this is why I made that statement. In verse 23, then Jesus 
began his ministry at 30 years of age. He began his ministry after he had received the Holy Spirit because before then, he tried when he was younger. He was found in the temple preaching at 12 years old. He knew he had a call on his life. But the Holy Spirit had not yet descended upon him. So he had to wait for that appointed time. Once he had that Holy Spirit, he was able to go into the fullness of the ministry that God had for him. So why do we think it's any different for us? Why do we think that we can do anything apart from the Holy Spirit? Without the Holy Spirit, we are powerless. Because the Holy Spirit, let's go ahead and read that. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, But you shall receive what? Power. When are we going to receive power? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He didn't say you're going to receive power when you're born. He didn't say you're going to receive power when you graduate high school or when you come to salvation. He says you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why would you want to walk around in your ministry powerless? Yes, you can still do a great work here on earth. You can still minister to people. You can still walk in a lot of your ministry and in your gifts without receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Jesus did. Jesus did many great things. But you know what? To fulfill the completeness of your work, you need power. You need boldness. We all do. Sometimes we feel weak. Well, how can we, when we're weak, say that I am strong? It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can say that. And then when we say that and we know in faith that I have that power in me, then that power is going to manifest and it's going to work through me because I've declared what God the Father has said about me, that although I'm weak, I'm strong. And I heard that and it was a living word to me because I had the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 11, it says... In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it says, If then, being evil, he's talking about men, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit who ask him? He says that the Holy Spirit is a gift. And I can guarantee if somebody tells me they have a gift for me, that's not a light thing. I want that gift. And I will go after that gift. I will travel for miles for that gift. <laughs> if I think it's a really good gift, I will travel for hours for that gift. Right? Who's with me on that? You like some gifts, okay? Especially if you know it's from somebody who has a little bit of money because they might buy the better gift, right? <laughs> so God is saying here that I have a gift for you. Why are we in the church refusing to receive a gift that our Father has for us? And he says, all you have to do is ask it because I'm not going to force this gift on you. If you choose not to unwrap and receive this gift, that's up to you. That's up to you. Same thing with salvation. If you choose not to unwrap and receive that gift, that's up to you. But God says, I have another gift for you. He's not talking about salvation in this scripture. He says, I have a gift and it's called the Holy Spirit. I have it for you. Will you receive it? If you receive it, you're going to get power. You're going to get a guide, a compass. You're going to get a teacher. You're going to get a helper and a comforter. You're going to get someone to tell you things to come so you don't have to worry about the unknown. But will you receive it? It's important that we don't get wrapped up 
into all the doctrines that's out there and cause division in our churches over a good gift. If God calls something a good gift, how good must it be? I mean, really? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 12. Let's talk about some of these gifts. I'm not going to go into depth on these gifts. What I want is that this message will stir you up to do your own study on the Holy Spirit because as you peel back those layers, you're going to see so much more. I just want this to be an overview so that you're stirred up to go back and do some, some study on your own. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 through 12, it says there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's one Spirit, but many diverse gifts. There's different ministries, but the same Lord. There's different activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each for the profit of all. The Holy Spirit is a gift that is to profit and benefit everyone. Everyone. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy and discerning of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. So there's so many gifts but how many times have you been in a church where there's division over which gift is the right gift or the wrong gift or doesn't work anymore or still to come and all that? How many times have you heard division over the gifts that the Holy Spirit, who is a gift, is here to bring to us? That's not what God wants. He doesn't want the division. He Diversity is great. He said there's a diverse a number of gifts. But don't let that diversity of gifts create division in the church. Why? Because in verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. We need to be one body. And not look at someone else and say, well, Rick, your gift is not right because it's not the same as my gift. Your gift is not right because I've never seen it operate before. <laughs> right? <laughs> so since that, since your gift doesn't look like another gift I've seen before or that I've operated in before, then I can't fellowship with you. You must not be of the right church. No, we are one body. We need to respect and acknowledge the diversity of gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to the church. And we need to study to know what those gifts are so that if there is a false spirit that comes in, we can easily recognize it. You don't have to study all the falseness, just study the truth. If you study and know the truth, then you'll know when something else comes in. <laughs> you know? And the Holy Spirit is your teacher, so he will teach you what's right. And he'll reveal to you those things that are not right. The most important thing that I want you to understand here is that the Holy Spirit brings unity to the body, even in our differences. But a lot of times, man will want to bring disunity by pointing out the differences. And the church is guilty of that. Why do you think we have all these denominations and stuff? Because somebody believes something different than somebody else. Let's come together. The Holy Spirit is here to bring us together as one body and one spirit in Christ. But we all need to function in the role that he has intended for us to play. Let's see how this has accomplished the, the unity and what happens when we have unity. Genesis 11, verse, four, verse 1 says, Now the whole earth has had one language and one speech. Okay, so this is when they were building the Tower of Babel. Everybody had one language and one speech. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You just understand everybody. 
no miscommunication. Everybody's understood. If you go down to verse 4, it says, They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down and see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. The people are one. What should we be? The church should be one. And they all have one language. What's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit? He speaks to us, right? He speaks through us. He gives us the things to say. What are we saying? The one thing that God tells us to say. We're not all saying the one thing that God tells us to say. But the Holy Spirit intends for the church to have the same language, the language of God, saying what His Word says, saying what He decrees. That's what He wants the church to do. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Why? Because they are one and they have one language. Think about that. If the church were one and we all spoke the same thing, the thing that the Holy Spirit tells us to speak from God the Father, nothing would be withheld from us. Nothing would be impossible to us because we're doing what God says to do. We're saying what God says to say if we're one. They were one here. But they were thinking about themselves. They were looking to themselves to build this great monument so everybody would recognize their accomplishment. So God came down and stirred up the languages and said, Okay, now y'all can't y'all can't be one. We need to have some some differences here. Let's let's go down so you can't communicate. We'll split you, separate you, because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So we had that division they're no longer one they're no longer saying the same thing but if we fast forward a few thousand years to acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4 and i know i'm over my time but if you adjust for the time we got started <laughs> I'm, I'm hurrying okay acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4 when the day of pentecost fully came they were all in one accord. We don't see that again until they were on the day of Pentecost and they all came back together. The church came together and they said, let's be one again. And they were in one accord. They were in the same place. And suddenly a sound from heaven came as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and each and one set upon each of them. It doesn't say they were all the same. It just says one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to do what? Speak. What did we just read in Genesis? They were all one. They were all speaking the same thing. They were all doing the same thing. And then they were divided because they had selfish motives. But now on the day of Pentecost, God comes back and brings his children together in one place. And guess what? He gives them the same speak. They all became one again. They all began speaking the same thing again. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. That brought unity back to God's people. The Bible says that our tongue is like a rudder of a ship directing where it should go. So how else would we expect God to direct his church unless he used our mouth? How else would we expect it? <laughs> so what has he done? He's gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can all begin speaking the same thing again. What does he want us to say? He wants us to say the things that we hear from the Father through the Holy Spirit to us. And that's what he wants us to speak. That's what Jesus spoke. That's what he wants. Why? Because if we all act as one body and we all not just act as one body, but are one body and become one body, 
nothing would be impossible. But all things would be possible. Why? Because we'd be doing it through Christ. Through Him who strengthens us. How does He strengthen us? Through His Holy Spirit who gives us power. That's the ministry and the importance of the Holy Spirit. So don't get divided over the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the ministry of God, of the Trinity, that brings unity to the church. So why do you think the enemy has tried to bring so much division on the topic of the Holy Spirit? It's because that's the one piece of the Trinity that brings us all together into unity. Not only that, but he brings boldness. Acts chapter 4 Verse 29 through 31. This is my last scripture. The church has been silenced. Why is the church silenced? Because we're not all speaking the same thing. We're not in unity. Some are saying one thing. Some are saying another thing. Some are saying it's okay for, um, for same-sex same marriages. Some are saying it's not okay for same-sex marriages. Some are saying it's okay for abortion. Some are saying it's not okay. We're... We're, we're not speaking the same thing. We're not saying the same thing. And so one part of the body of Christ has been silenced. The part that's not going along with the majority of the world has been silenced. So where's our boldness? In Acts chapter 4 verse 29, I'm going to show you how to get the boldness back. Acts 4, 29 through 31, it says the Lord, now Lord, they're praying. Okay? The Christians are praying, saying, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with with the Holy Spirit. And then guess what they did? They spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. Why? Because they were confident that what they were speaking was the direct word of the Father. Spoken to them by the Holy Spirit. So in closing, I just pray that God reveals and continues to reveal his Holy Spirit and the ministries of His Holy Spirit to you and open up things that you haven't seen before. Just see Him in a new light and receive Him to work in you and through you in all of these different gifts that He has to give you. And I pray that you go out and that as you're stirred up and you know and have confidence in the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you go out in boldness and speak as one, as the body of Christ. Any, and my time is up. Down. Father, I thank you that you bless us indeed. You enlarge our territory. Your hands with us to keep us from evil so that we do not cause pain. And I thank you for blessing us and keeping us and for making your face to shine upon us and being gracious unto us. You lift up your countenance upon us and you give us peace. So, Lord, we gladly invite you to rise up. Let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.